that is we had the children and the youth be in here tonight because we want them to see the church agree on things. We want them to see the church act, and, uh, and so we appreciate them. We're going to give them time to get out of here, and I'm going to ask you, if you will, at this time to stand up and greet one another. If you have your Bible, please stand up and raise your Bible above your head and bear witness of God's Word. Amen. You may be seated. We were in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8 this morning. I would invite you to turn back to Nehemiah chapter 8. This morning I ask you the question, do you agree with God? We're able to see what the Bible says about agreement and how important it is for us to agree with God, not just verbal agreement, but an agreement that's demonstrated by our actions. We read in Nehemiah chapter 8 when the children of Israel came back to Jerusalem after the walls were built. They came in agreement and asked for Ezra to read the book of the law. They wanted to hear again the statutes of God. They wanted to hear the promises of God. They wanted to hear the commandments of God. They wanted to hear the covenant agreement that God made with Abraham. They wanted to be reminded of this. They wanted to hear this, and they wanted to hear it again. They understood that their key to God's blessing was to live in agreement with Him, but also they wanted for everyone to hear it. Because they realized the reason they had been in captivity all these years is because they had lived in disagreement with God. They understood that they wouldn't be blessed if they lived in disagreement with God. Did you see this morning how big a subject this was? We were able to see when we got to chapter 9 that they came together in agreement and confessed. They confessed their sin to God. They renewed their covenant agreement with God. And we read in the book of Amos that God told those disobedient people in Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together? except they agree, meaning that he can't walk with them and fellowship with them if they're living lives that don't agree with what he says they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to live. And I'm just recapping here because it's such a big subject. And the church, this church, this church body needs to hear this. We also learned in Nehemiah chapter 8 when Ezra read this book of the law that they began to praise the Lord together. They had a worship service. Now get this, it was a worship service of agreement. When Ezra read this book of the law, remember he read from morning to midday. And then he stood back up and he read different times. And they, they honored, they reverenced the word of God. They stood as he began to read it. All the people once... Nehemiah began to, to praise the Lord. This was after the reading. This is verse 6 of Nehemiah 8. It says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen. 
with lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their face to the ground. I want to recap this and I know you learned it this morning, but again, we're revisiting it because it's so important. We learned this morning that amen by definition means a solemn ratification of agreement. That's the definition. Meaning it is so or so be or I agree. So they stood up and they said, I agree, I agree. This affirmation wasn't just one person saying, I agree with what you read. No, the whole assembly was there. And they said, amen, amen. And then they raised their hands. Understand, worship broke out. They weren't even singing a song at that point and worship broke out, right? Why? Because they heard the truth of God together and they agreed together. Celebration started. And what I want you to see tonight is that worship, worship, well, it's a celebration agreement. A celebration agreement. When we all come together, we can individually worship God. And you know that, right? In your prayer, in your reading of his word. But when we come together collectively, we're agreeing to worship God together, which means that we're all in agreement, that we all agree with God. Now, is there power in that? Man, there's power in that. That's when the spirit of God begins to move. We can't be in agreement with God if we disagree with his word. And I gave you that statement this morning. But we also learn in order to truly believe, in order to put our belief in God, in order to be saved, that we have to agree with God. In order to truly confess our sins and be forgiven of our sins, we have to agree with God. I gave you two passages of Scripture this morning, and I'm just catching you up to where we need to jump in. But I gave you the passage in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I gave you the passage in Romans 10, 9, and 10, which says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, what were our key words in both of those scriptures? Anybody remember this morning? Confess. And, and this was the beautiful thing. If you go back and you look, that confess, if you confess, your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you. And that confess, that if thou shalt confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, it's two kinds of confession. One of them is confessing sin. The other is confessing belief. But both confessions, both word confess, comes from the Greek word homologeo, which means to say the same as. To say the same as. It's amazing when you look at the, the word homo, to, it means the same. Logo means word, to say the same word. That's what it's saying. And that's the word we have for confess, 25 times in the New Testament. Amazing. You say, well, hey, that's just some kind of, of knowledge that maybe some pastor might get off on. It's Greek, it's this or that kind of thing. What I'm trying to tell you is it gives us the definition of agreement. Because the definition of agreement is to say the same or to share the same opinion, which the word that God uses is confess. So if you confess to God your sin to be forgiven, basically you're agreeing with God that what he said you have violated. You cannot be forgiven until you confess, correct? Now understand this. Confession only comes after conviction. And conviction is the product of guilt. You don't feel guilt unless you feel conviction. So the devil knows if he can take away the conviction, if he can change the meaning of what sin is, then you might not be convicted of it. If you're not convicted, you're not going to feel guilt. If there's no guilt, there's no confession. If there's no confession, there's no repentance. Does that make sense? So the devil doesn't need to have us be against God and say, hey, we don't want to confess. He just wants to convince us that we don't need to confess. How can he convince us? If we can start not agreeing with God on what sin really is. So when you confess your sins, you're saying, God, I agree with you that I stepped out of your will. I agree with you that I was wrong and you were right. That's hard for people, isn't it? 
But then that other confession in Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that confession we would call profession, but it's the same word, homologeo, which means that I'm confessing. I'm professing that I agree with you, God. You are who you say you are, the one and only true living God. But he says you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. He's saying you're making an agreement with your mouth that you believe that Jesus is who God says Jesus is, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the one and only person that ever lived that never sinned, the only person that could be the sacrifice for my sin, I'm confessing, professing, homologeo. I'm saying the same thing you're saying, God, so I'm stating my belief. Isn't that cool? That's agreeing with God. It happens when we confess, when we profess. We learn that this morning and understand it. this agreement. Well, it's a big deal. So to confess our belief in God is to agree with God. That's what has to happen for a person to be saved. You're stating your belief to him, but it happens in the heart. I'm confessing in my heart that I, I want to be in agreement with you, God. I don't want to just take the part that gets me to heaven. I want to agree with you that this book of the law that you have, I'm going to agree with it, not part of it, all of it even though I don't want to agree with all of it. You say, I can't believe you, Pastor. Don't be so high and mighty. You don't want to agree with all of it either. If you really wanted to, then you would have. Anybody in here ever agree with all of it in all your actions? Any sinless people in here? No. There's a part of us that at times in our life, we don't want to agree with what it says, right? But we've agreed when we came to believe in God, that we will take it and we will agree with it. We'll try to live by it. Now, how do I know when I'm not in agreement? Don't you know that God makes a way for us? The first thing he does is that every human being, and I want you to understand this, every human being, you might have people out there that says, hey, I don't believe in God, or I believe this thing that God said is wrong. I believe it's right. Understand this. They can say what they want to say, but God tells us in his word, Romans 1, that he put something, Romans 2, in every person he ever created, and it's called a conscience. And God speaks, and he tells right and wrong. The person that stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with you and says, I just don't believe that, they're just disagreeing with God, but God's given them the truth in their heart. They can disagree with it adamantly, but what's happened in their life is they have begun to agree with themselves instead of God. And he addresses that in Romans 1 when he says, the creature is thinking that he is better than the creator. He's worshiping himself. These people that are adamantly against God, they're worshiping their own knowledge. And God tells us what I'll do is the worst punishment. I'll give them over to themselves, meaning I'll let them think they're right. You said, that's no punishment. That's an eternal punishment because they never come into agreement with God and they're totally separated from God. You said, that's what they deserve. No, I feel sorry for them because that's what you deserve and I deserve too. I've never done anything and you've never done anything good enough to gain God's salvation. It's by his grace. It's by his mercy. I love what Bird Dog says. On my best day, I've never done anything good enough to get God. Doesn't matter how much I turn my life around, I've never done anything good enough, but I've done plenty enough not to deserve to have him. You know, when we look and we see that we have to come in agreement with God, then we realize that there's a lot of people that, as we mentioned this morning, are not in full agreement with God. They believe parts of what he says. And they take those parts and they pepper those parts and they accept the parts. Listen, I want to tell you and just pull the cloak off of this. That's somebody agreeing with themselves. And if God happens to have said the same thing, then they accept God. But they're not agreeing with God. They're agreeing with themselves. Who am I to pick and choose out of God's word what I want, what I want to agree with? I either agree with him or I don't. You know, we talked this morning about that scene back in the book of Nehemiah. And I want to tell you as a church body, this agreement with God is important. 
My focus tonight is the power of agreement when we come together and we all agree on God. First of all, agreement requires that we believe in Him. If you believe that, then use your word of agreement. Good job. Hey, you're passing. Agreement with God also requires that we trust Him. If you agree with that, use your word of agreement. Agreement with God requires that we submit to Him as the authority of us and everything else. For a person that does not submit to God's authority, do you realize they'll never agree with Him? They'll continue to value their own opinion over God's, and at best, they will live a life arguing against God, never coming to an agreement. Do you know people like this? They argue. They'll argue with you. They're not coming into agreement with Him. Arguing is a funny thing. I've watched it for years and years. I've been blessed over these years to, to sit in on thousands of marriage counselings. Arguments, disagreements. Let's call them disagreements. Sometimes they escalate. But at the end of the day, they're disagreements. That means the two people don't agree by simple definition. And the one person is so adamantly trying to say what they want to say. Has this ever happened in anybody's house? Anybody? Bear witness. That disagreement can go on because one person is so adamantly wanting the other person to agree with them that they're not really listening to their part. They just want to make sure their part gets across, right? That argument can continue and it's coupled with emotions, right? That disagreement goes on and on. And I've told the Marriage retreat this back when we met earlier or, or met last year. That whole thing about arguing. It matters a lot more how a couple argues than it does how they get along. You can get along for six days a week and argue and you don't have a good marriage. You can get along for three weeks out of the month. But argue for a week, you're not happy right? It's as if in that disagreement, there's one person or both people. They're so adamantly stating their point. They're, they're basically saying, you need to agree with me for this to be over. Is that true? Like we're sitting there waiting, like the other person's going to stop in the middle of, uh, of the argument and say, you know what? You're right. How many people has that ever happened to in here? <laughs> Anybody? Doesn't happen. Disagreement is contention. But agreement is great. Agreement means you can walk together, right? And that's what God is saying. People live in disagreement with him. Now, this submitting to God is a big deal. For a person that doesn't submit to God's authority, they'll never agree with him. I gave you the picture of a, of a child. Do you realize that that parent is going to continually tell that child, do this, don't do that? That parent should be telling that child, do this, don't do that. But if that child does not submit to that parent's authority, they'll live in disagreement with that parent. Do you know what it sounds like when a child lives in disagreement with that parent? It sounds like crying. They cry, and they cry, and they cry. Why? Because they're crying because they're not hurt. They're crying because they don't get their way. Their way is what they want the parent to agree with. They do what they can, and if the parent, if the parent even in the act of love, agrees with the child on a regular basis, and lets the child win, then the child won't submit to the parent. So understand, that child will continually think the parent has to agree with them because there's no submission that's there. And there shouldn't be because if the parent's going to give in, then the child is going to be a professional crier. It gets them what they want. Why? Because they're not willing to submit. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. And listen, you might disagree with this. But let a child cry. If you don't let a child cry, 
then you're going to listen to that child whine the rest of their life. They're not going to die of crying. Now, here's the way the Lord does us. When we cry because we're hurt, oh, the Father picks us up, whether it's emotionally or physically. But when we cry because we're not getting our way, He lets us cry. Amen? So that we can ultimately learn we need to submit and agree with what he says we need to do, right? Or else he's going to let us keep living crying, right? Nobody wants to keep living crying, so what do we need to do? Submit. What I want you to see is that every, every time we talk about agreement, we need to understand the power that God has given us in agreement. There's power when people who agree with God come together and agree with God together. Amen? There's a power in it. Agreeing with God is the essence of worship. When we worship God together, we're agreeing with God together. Our praise by song or testimony. Do you know that that's, that's us agreeing with God together? We did that this morning, didn't we? We're sitting singing praise to God for who he is. That's us agreeing with God together. How much does it bless the person that doesn't want to get involved? Well, it doesn't. But then if they begin to get some of that reciprocal spirit moving in them, that's happened to me before, right? Has it happened to you before? Just being around it because there's such power in the agreement of worship that when it happens, it'll get on somebody beside of you right? And then our worship of learning God's word, either taught or preached, that's agreeing with God together. There is power in our collective agreement. Power. There's power in this meeting that we had tonight. We already looked at the agreement celebration in the book of Nehemiah, but I want to show you more. Do you want to see more? I want to show you that even the church, the churches we are, the body of believers, do you realize the body of believer exists and edifies and glorifies God because of the collective agreement we have together? I could take you back to the book of Acts, and you don't need to turn there, and I'll just paraphrase, but do you understand that when those believers began to meet together, it said they had all things in common. Does that mean agree? They were in one accord. You know that that's one of the definitions for agreement, to be in one accord. What were they agreeing on? The place they needed to meet or what they needed to eat? No, we can't agree on that. What could they agree on? They could agree that God is who he says he is and that Jesus Christ is who God says he is. And they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They met together in agreement. And they had all things in common. And they learned the apostles' doctrine. They broke bread together. They fellowshiped together. They prayed together. And God did mighty things. He, he showed them signs and wonders, right? Why? Agreement. And they didn't have to bring their own opinions in there. They all agree with each other. Collective agreement is powerful. And I want to show you how powerful. You see, it's the basis, the essence of our worship and who we are here together. We don't all have to agree on what the, the air needs to be set on tonight, right? And I doubt that we would, right? We don't have to agree what color carpet is in here. If we build something, we don't have to agree that this should go here, that this should go there. But the power of collective agreement, knowing that we all believe that God is who he says he is, do you know that that will even bring us together on decisions that have nothing to do with God? I've seen it happen. Even things that we would all struggle with because we're, we're opinionated. We have the way that we think. I want you to understand that we have several examples in the Bible, and I want to show you some of those. And the first one comes in the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 16. I want you to turn there if you will. This to me has always been a, an awesome passage of Scripture. In 1 Chronicles 16, just to let you know what's going on, I don't need to give a whole lesson on the Ark of the Covenant, but understand the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. Amen? Anybody know that? And so when the Ark of the Covenant was not in Jerusalem, when the Ark of the Covenant was not among the children of Israel, 
the blessings went with the Ark of the Covenant. And so when the Ark of the Covenant was coming back to Jerusalem, we realized the first time they did it wrong because they didn't follow God's orders, right? But then David pitched a tent. Amen. And they brought the Ark of the Covenant back in there, and man, there was a celebration. If you read 1 Chronicles chapter 16, you begin. It says, so they brought the ark of God and set it back in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before God. And when David had made an end of the offering of burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. It goes on to tell you that it was a big event that day. It was a celebration. But listen, it was a celebration of agreement. Say it with me. A celebration of what? Agreement. Now the whole thing. A, a what? This is an important term I want you to remember. Because when you get to verse 7, I want to tell you what happened on that day. It says, then on that day, David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. Listen to the psalm or the song. Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all of his wondrous works. Glory you in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgment of his mouth. O ye seed of Israel, his servant, you seed of Jacob, his chosen one. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are all in the earth. He goes on and he goes on. And I want you to understand that when you get to verse 16, this is what he says. He says, even of the covenant which he made with Abraham and of his oath unto Isaac. Don't you know that David is remembering the covenant agreement again? This is a praise service. If you read on, you'll, you'll see where they begin to sing and play and dance, celebrating, right? What were they celebrating? They were celebrating their agreement in God. And when you get to verse 36, he says, blessed, let me read verse 34 if I can first through 36. He says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. And say ye, this is what David is saying, save us, O oh God, of our salvation and gather us together. And deliver us from the heathen that we might give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Now listen to his praise. Sounds a lot like Ezra's. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. Hold on a second. And all the people said. And all the people said. Amen. And all the people said what? Amen. Which means. I agree. Do you see this collective agreement that they had in worship? This was a celebration agreement, and all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. What I want you to understand is that when we gather together like this, no, it's not the Ark of the Covenant coming back into the camp, but don't you know, when we come in here, the presence of God is in here. And when we come in with collective agreement saying, I believe in the one and only true living God, I've accepted his salvation through Jesus Christ. I believe his inerrant word. I sing praise to him. I'm thanking him for his grace. I'm thanking him for what he does. I'm thanking him for what he's going to do. I thank him. I praise him. And we have that collective agreement. Understand that agreement is a celebration agreement. That's why the spirit of God begins to move. Every time we have a service, whether it be a Wednesday night or Sunday night, sometimes we might think, oh, it's just a Wednesday night service, a Sunday night service. It's no different than the big scene that played out in Jerusalem. It's a celebration agreement every time we get to come in and proclaim his word. A celebration agreement. And does God honor that? Absolutely, he honors it. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And all the people said, amen. Then we need to know that this position of agreement with God, well, it's not something we're just going to read that happened. It's not something that we're just saying happens now. How many people feel like when we come in here, we're in a celebration agreement when we're praising the Lord? Anybody? How many people have heard the preached word of God or the taught word of God? And all of a sudden you realize, hey, we're all in agreement in here. And all of a sudden I'm understanding things that I didn't used to understand. 
Well, can I tell you something? Don't give the preacher or the teacher credit for that. Why? Because the power of agreement, when you come together and you're willing to put yourself there, just like he said in Nehemiah this morning, when they heard the words, the Lord gave them ability to understand those things because the Holy Spirit will give you agreement. Now, it helps if the preacher or teacher has agreement with the Lord too because God anoints them to be able to say something in a way and then he takes that, the Spirit takes that, right? As a matter of fact, if your preacher or teacher is not in agreement with the Lord, then it can stop that process because they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to know that, and this is a big deal, and I have to, I have to say this. You know, I was a little giddy this morning. Is giddy okay to say? I was spiritually giddy. Here's why. Well, because we began to sing those songs this morning. And we sang that song, Is He Worthy? He Is. And don't you know, when I was preparing and I was just asking God, hey God, uh, Direct me in a way on agreement. I wound up over in the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation. And I watched the scene unfold and I got lost in that scene. Knowing that that celebration agreement was documented so well. When Jesus Christ raptures us and takes us off of this earth. Don't you know while all that's going on here on the earth for seven years. That we're going to assemble around the throne of God. And it tells us in Revelation chapter 4, well, listen, we're outsiders watching as the beast and the 24 elders fall down and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and always will be. But in chapter 5, hey, we're put in there, right? And basically, that chapter talks about the only one that was worthy, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah. We sang about that this morning, and I could hardly contain myself because, listen, it's not that God was on my page. I love getting on his page, right? Why? That means there's agreement. There's something good that happens, right? You ever been reading your Bible, and you just stopped, and you thought, man, that's good. You know what happened? You just came into agreement with God, and he wants you to say that's good all the time. Turn to Revelation 5, will you? The Bible tells us what's going to happen in the future. If you're a believer and you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to give you a scene that you're going to take part in, can I? The Bible says here in Revelation 5 that the new song that we as believers will sing in heaven when we're all gathered together and Jesus the Lamb is crowned King of Kings. It talks about this. But what I really want you to see is that this is a celebration of agreement. And what is the celebration of agreement? That Jesus is the only one worthy to be king of all humanity because he lived a sinless life and then sacrificed his life. He gave his life as a sacrifice for our sin. And this is the big deal. This is going to be evident when we stand in this scene because everyone that will be gathered around the throne will realize none of us could be there if it wasn't for him. Is he worthy? He is. Who else could be there? Could Brad be there? No, Brad's not worthy. Sorry, Brad, but you've sinned. Pete, let's get Pete. Can we crown Pete? We can't. Pete, have you sinned? Pete's not worthy. Glenn, have you sinned? He's not worthy. Who is worthy? Well, see, John, John was sharing his thoughts out loud because John the Revelator wrote this down. John actually was taken by God into this scene, into the future, so he could share it to us. Isn't that beautiful? God gives us a glimpse of what's to come. Revelation chapter 5. It's beautiful. John said in verse 1, And I saw... In the right hand of him that sat on the throne, this is God, a book written within, amen, Rodney, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Now, the book, rest of the book of Revelation is the opening of those seals, but let me go on. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? You see, the only one that could open the seals of this book, which was the title deed of the earth, all of humanity, the supreme 
power of humanity. The only one that could open the book would be the one that was worthy. And the angel said, who is worthy? And I'm looking at this scene and I'm seeing him pointing out, Pete, you're there and I'm there and Kyle, you're there. And he's, who's worthy? You know what I have to do? <laughs> what about you? Man, God paints a pretty picture. Watch. It says, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereof. John shows his emotion here. He said, and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereof. <coughs> and one of the elders said unto me, Listen, weep not. Behold. Now hold on a second. This word behold. Weep not. Behold means, hey, look over there. Weep not. Behold. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. Prevailed what? He conquered life. He conquered death. He conquered sin. The line of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. All of a sudden, we see Jesus, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah came as a lamb, right? But not just the strong lamb. They saw him as the lamb that had been slain. It says, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, amen, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. And I beheld... It's John speaking, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea. And all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Listen, and the four beasts said what? Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. In verse 7, Jesus took the book, this title deed to all of humanity. Whose hand was the book in? Hand was, the book was in the hand of the creator. He was handing the power, ownership. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was Jesus in John 1. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When he took the book out of the hand, this is after John was weeping because no one was worthy to take the book. And remember, you're going to be in that scene, right? Everybody was in agreement. They had to be in agreement by belief to be there. You would have to be in agreement to be there. But when he took the book, all of a sudden, the scales were off everyone's eyes. There is the lamb. He's the only one that's worthy to take that book. When he took the book, in verse 8, celebration broke out. The Bible says worship begins. 
And what kind of celebration? An agreement celebration. Verse 9 says they sang a new song. What was the song? Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals, for you were the one that was slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. Don't you know that there's no more celebration that you will have about something good that happened at your job or some good doctor's report or some good thing that you just bought or acquired or some good thing that you just ate. When you're with... Uh, Jesus Christ in the presence of God, understanding that separation from God is eternal damnation and your sins, my sins, make us deserve there. When you look at the one that redeemed you and he was slain, don't you know that agreement with everybody is going to be just a running, shouting match when we're pointing to the Lamb? Amen. Glory to God. In verse 10, the praise goes on because then after they praise him in agreement that you're the only one that can take the book and that you're the one that redeemed us, it says then, this is big, you allowed us to reign with you. That you know, friend, I don't care what you own, what's in your bank account, who you are, what your pedigree is, the God of all creation and Jesus Christ, your Savior, wants you to reign with him. And how did they know that already? How did these people know that they were going to reign with him? We have to understand that Jesus, in his aura, bringing everybody together in agreement, was letting them know Hey, it's not about just me. You're with me, right? You've already made it here with me. Now you're going to be in eternity with me. It won't be about your future goals. It'll be about putting your future in his hand. And that's what it is now. But then it'll be about realizing your future is in his hand. Verse 11 is huge. It says, all the angels worshiped. Can I tell you what this is again? It's a celebration agreement. Remind me what it is. Let's see the scope of this, verse 11. And I, behold, I beheld, the, heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. Now we can add that up, can't we? 10,000 times 10,000. Does anybody know what 10,000 times 10,000 is? Somebody tell me. Oh, I see you punching it in. You could actually get to that number punching it in on your calculator, 10,000 times 10,000, right? But then you know God. You know what he said? And thousands and thousands. Right? He said 10,000 times 10,000. You said, well, I, I can tell you what that is. No, you can't, because his way of saying this was saying, there's so many, you can't number them. Right? There's numbers that I never thought we would reach with our national debt. And he said there's going to be more angels, glory to God, singing praise to him than that. Right? But it doesn't stop there. It gets better. It tells you what they were saying. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. What I need you to see here is that everybody is on the same page. There's not one naysayer in that scene that's saying, I don't think it should be him. It says everybody was saying, he's the one to receive power. He's the only one worthy. There was nobody with a dissenting view in that whole group of people. Can you imagine being in a group of a hundred people that agree with something? A thousand. What about a group of 10,000 people that are all agreeing? Wouldn't that be great? We find it hard sometimes just to get us and somebody else. But can you imagine thousands times thousands of angels and then all the people, all the redeemed, those that are raptured, everybody is saying he is the only one worthy. Can you imagine the power of that agreement? That's a celebration agreement. Hey, that's yet to come. But I'm warming up for it. Are you? We should warm up for it every time we get in here. Verse 13. Doesn't stop there. Hold on. It's not just people that are there. And every creature 
which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying. You mean to tell me every creature on the earth? Yeah. Guess who made them? What are they going to be doing? Well, let's just see. Such as are in the sea, and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. I want to tell you this in closing. I've talked to you this morning and this evening about being in agreement with God, right? I ask you, do you agree with God? Tonight I talked about a celebration agreement. I need to give you one bit of information to close with. After this time, and Jesus returns to this earth, and the judgment of mankind happens, do you know there will not be one person, whether in heaven or hell, that disagrees with God? You say, the people in hell won't agree. They'll agree adamantly with him. For all of eternity. That person that you're talking to now that refutes and, listen, that person will agree with God. The Bible tells us that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. What does that tell me? Every single person will agree with God. That person that thinks they've turned into an atheist or an agnostic and they don't even know the difference, they're going to agree with God. I want them to agree with God on this side. But now that we get to agree with God on this side, I would challenge you and say, what are you doing with your agreement? Is it your strength? There's power in that agreement. But then church, hey listen, you're listening to a pastor that there's nothing special about me at all. All of us have our faults. All of us have our, our reasons that God should have thrown us away. We, we, none of us are worthy. He is. None of us are. But collectively, <laughs> you know, collectively, if this bunch of misfits come together, and we praise God together. And we agree on that together. And we agree on the truth of the word together. Don't you know there's a power that's here? God has let us see things that I never thought I would see. God is letting us experience things that I never thought I would experience. He lets me feel peace that I never thought I would feel. And that collective, that collective agreement that celebration of worship that we have in here, God intended for that because it strengthens us. I want you to look at this church body as a place where we can have a celebration agreement. You know, you look forward to going to a party or a celebration, don't you? And that's the way we should look when we're coming to worship God together. Don't you know this scene that happens in Revelation chapter 5. If you're not willing to take part of it now, don't think that you just want to step up then, right? God's given you a chance on this side of it to worship him, to celebrate him. Is he worthy of your worship? Amen. Then we need to celebrate him. How do you celebrate him? We celebrate him by song and praise. We celebrate him by opening his word. We celebrate him together by coming and fellowshipping with each other. We celebrate him together by praying together. We celebrate him together. Anytime that we assemble and we, we have testimony or we have song or we have the reading of the scripture or we have an event or we have the children or we have the youth, we celebrate him together. There's a strength that happens there. Then, that agreement and we have to realize this, that agreement's not something that's turned off and turned on. And I have to point this out. This is never a place where we want to manipulate your praise. It's never a place where I want to manipulate you to praise God and tell you you need to come in here and praise God. No, first of all, I tell you you need to praise God when you're not here. 
this is not a place for you to come in and turn it on and turn it off. You need to be able to agree with God outside of here. Because if you're not agreeing with God outside of here, listen, you're not agreeing when you come in here. But if you agree with God outside of here and then you bring it in here, watch out. Amen? That's church. How many people want to agree with God? Amen. Agree with Him in your prayer life. Agree with Him in your daily walk. He'll blow your mind. And the power of collective agreement when we come to church, be a part of it. Look forward to it. It's a celebration agreement. Father God, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for who you are. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to be a part of what you're doing. I look forward, Lord, to that time and I look back to the time of celebration agreement we read about in Nehemiah, we read about, Lord, in First Chronicles. But, Lord, I look forward to the Revelation 5 celebration agreement. I look forward to, to the time, Lord, but right now we're still here. You've got us here for a reason. So, Lord, we agree that you are who you say you are. We want to celebrate you. Lord, we want to feel that collective power. Use us, Lord. Use us to agree with you and agree together. And let us see your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand? Is anyone here worthy? Is anyone worthy? John cried about it, right? So you mean to tell me that not one person here is worthy. But yet, he sees fit to make you a part of what he's doing. I would call that grace, right? Page 104. We'll sing this for our invitation. If you want to praise him and come and pray, come and pray. If you want his strength, if you have something you want to just talk to him about, use this altar. Pray to him during this invitation while we sing page 104, Amazing Grace. come in agreement with you today, right? God blessed us. He's blessed us the whole day to leave here and take what he's spoken today and glean from it. Realize that, hey, tomorrow's another day that you can walk with him. In order to walk with him, you have to agree with him. 
Let the Holy Spirit be your guide. Never going to lead you wrong. I love you being here, and we'll come together the next time unless the Lord takes us home. And if the Lord takes us home, we've got a worship service coming that I told you about, right? So we're going to worship together again. Amen? Amen. I love you. Will you dismiss us? Gracious Heavenly Father, we just...